thanks for you know allowing me to be here. Um, I'm Krista Watts. I teach um, in the math department at the Military Academy West Point, um, which is just a wonderful collaborative um, place to be um, to give you an idea of sort of how we collaborate on everything. I was one of the people sort of dragging my feet, maybe the only person dragging my feet to give Jared a song and a fun fact. And so some of the guys that I work with yesterday during lunch, including Dusty Turner, who some of you may know, you know, spent their lunch break brainstorming to try to come up with anything fun that you know, I've ever done. Apparently I'm not a very fun person, so <laughs> um, they even help out with that. Um, and so here, some of you might recognize if you were here last year, the map on the right, these are Dusty's R runs. So this is the way we didn't really collaborate. We have his R run before last year's uh, conference. We have the one at the Joint Stats meetings in Vancouver. And then the one on the right, which I bailed on a couple days ago, is an R run at West Point where we work. So if it turns out if you start at the football stadium, loop around the intramural fields and end up at our building, it kind of kind of looks like a skinny little R. So today I'm going to talk um, about using statistical methods to estimate coefficients in allometric models. So allometry is just a study of the relationship between body size to things like shape, anatomy, different biological measures. Um, and there's a variety of fields that they're important in, a variety of applications. Um, I'm going to talk about these three, but for instance, I have um, a thesis student next year who's going to use these same types of models to look at preventing injuries in cadets. Um, so we have a lot of uh, data, you know, on them. All right. Uh, so the first one we were looking at allometric scaling of uh, weight to height in two Asian populations. And so most of you are probably familiar, you know what body mass index is, BMI. It sort of normalizes height to weight um, in the sense that if we have someone who's 4 foot 10 and weighs 160 pounds and someone who's 6 foot 10 and weighs 160 pounds, we don't really want to make a head-to-head -head comparison of those weights. Um, and so BMI scales actually weight to height squared. And um, it's used to classify adiposity or obesity and um, overweight status. And so we all probably know someone who's like, you know, got a BMI of 35 and 0.4% body fat or something. And we say, well, you know, is BMI really, because it's not body fat percentage, right? It's just, it's just a proxy for that. But it turns out that in Caucasian populations, BMI is actually very highly correlated to body fat percentage. So it's not perfect, but it is a good measure when, you know, height and weight are relatively easy to measure compared to, you know, your actual body fat percentage. Um, but it hasn't really been tested much in Asian populations. And so this paper looked at answering a number of questions. These are sort of the two we want to look at. Um, does weight scale to height squared? So is BMI a good measure of body fat percentage in um, Asian Indians? And do, um, is the relationship the same among different Asian Indian populations? So specifically, we're looking at tribal populations versus the general population. And so the data that we had um, was from two different large nationwide studies. One that was back in the 60s, the Anthropologic Survey of India, and another more recent study, the National Family Health Survey. Um, we've got almost 44,000 adults um, age 15 to 54 in the data, but only males. Um, so that's you know, one sort of big weakness of, the, of this analysis. Um, in India, cultural norms still make it hard to collect this type of data on women, and so we only have males in our, in our study. And there's lots of information in this data. We, the three that we ended up being interested in were height, weight, and then tribal status. Um, and so, you know, the, the top model here is sort of the basic allometric model, where on the left we have some sort of biological variable, in this case weight. Um, on the right we have a power law model with some body measurement, in this case height. Um, and so if, if I was talking to a group of doctors, I'd leave the epsilon off, but, you know, that's, that's there so to indicate that we are actually, our goal here is to estimate the alpha and the beta in that model. And if we're lucky and the epsilon turns out to have a log normal distribution, then we can log transform the model and we have just a simple linear regression model. Um, and then the other model that we wanted to fit accounted for tribal membership. So we have um, T is just a vector of zero and ones indicating what, what tribe you're, you are a member of or that you're from the general population. And then if that eta vector is all zeros, 
then we say that the scaling coefficient is consistent across all tribes in the general population. Yeah. And so here's my sort of obligatory R code. Jared set me up so perfectly for this. Um, he gave a lovely talk about R then and now. And you will probably see I'm stuck in the then. Um, I'm trying to change. You might notice I, I apparently was pretty optimistic I was going to use dply r. And then I assumed Dusty wasn't at work that day. And so I just went back to what I know in base r. But I'm, I'm trying to come around. Um, and so you know, here we just basically assigned tribal membership, did the log transform, fit a couple models, did an F test, and found that, yep, in fact, um, we do see a difference in those two models that were on the previous slide. Um, but what was, what's the takeaway? What's the bottom line? Uh, our unadjusted power beta in that first model was 2.08, so very close to 2. So it looks like, you know, in general, BMI is a pretty good um, assessment of the, the relationship between height and weight even in Asian Indians. Um, after we adjust for tribe, our beta was 2.09. But of the 33 tribes in our data, 24 had statistically different coefficients. Um, but they ranged from about 1.86 to 2.35. So if we add you know, beta plus eta, we end up with something um, in that range. And so um, our, the obesity researchers that we work with said, you know, th these are close enough, we would consider this a two. So yeah, they're statistically different, but for practical purposes, BMI seems to do an okay job even in all of these tribes. All right, so that was a pretty basic study. We had collaborators in India that were actually interested in answering this question. It actually started out as a student project. Um, a student did it for his senior capstone. Um, and you know, then we sort of cleaned it up some to be published. But, so now I want to move into something that I consider a little bit meatier. Um, or at least to me, this is, this is pretty interesting. Um, so I said before, BMI is a pretty good indicator of body fat percentage in Caucasian populations. I want to caveat that and say adult Caucasian populations. Um, and so right here, we have the CDC growth curve. So uh, maybe if you're a parent, you've seen something like this in, at the pediatrician's office. Um, and they're used during wellness exams, for instance. Um, and some schools use them to classify adiposity in children and adolescents. So on the horizontal axis, we have age in years. On the vertical axis, we have BMI. And then we have these different bands. And so the green band is what's considered normal weight. Yellow gives us um, a classification of obese, or sorry, of overweight. Red, obese, and then the sort of tan color at the bottom is underweight. And so, for instance, I go to the pediatrician with my daughter, and she comes up in the fourth percentile, and they say, you know, well, she's underweight. I have a pretty laid back pediatrician. I tend to be pretty laid back. Pediatrician looks at her and goes, I, you know, she's healthy. So don't worry about, don't worry about her BMI. Um, but that's not necessarily always the case. There can be very real consequences from this. Um, a lot of states send home letters, for instance, from school, if your child is considered to be overweight or obese. And so you can imagine that parents and pediatricians are treating um, or, or changing their behaviors because they think that their child is overweight. And if BMI isn't a good measure of your actual body fat percentage, then you know, maybe they're treating a problem that doesn't exist. Um, a, another example that I'm personally aware of is a child who, um, whose parents are divorced and mom has custody. And a letter comes home and says he's obese and dad's married to a pediatrician and is now using that, the fact that mom under mom's care, you know, Timmy's obese and he's suing for custody of the child. So we, you know, there are real world ramifications for getting this wrong. Um, additionally, this was a little disturbing to me. Um, you might notice these bands are determined by percentiles. And that is actually how we classify obesity in children. And so based on this, 5% of the population of, the, of children and adolescents will always be obese. And 15% will always be overweight or obese. And so they're not tied to any, you know, anything with, that, with proven health outcomes. And so you know, I, I went back and sort of questioned my, their, my collaborators, the, the doctors that we worked with on this. And they're like, yeah, I know. It's a really not a smart way to do it, but this is how it's done. Um, so you know, and then the last thing is probably most people in this room can look at this chart and kind of get an idea about what's going on pretty quickly. But you're a lot more used to working with data and graphics than 
perhaps the, the uh, American population in general. And so this is tough because the cutoffs for BMI change as, as you age for, for kids and adolescents. And so it's, um, these, it's just not accessible to a lot of parents to be able to look at this and immediately understand what's going on. Um, and so, so because BMI is not stable across ages. So um, some previous work done by my collaborators um, showed that weight doesn't scale to height squared in adolescents. So in other words, BMI is not a good indicator of body fat percentage in children and adolescents. Um, and they proposed a triponderal mass index. So TMI is just weight divided by height cubed. Um, and they found that that did estimate the body fat percentage better than BMI. Um, I got involved because um, they, there were a couple of mathematicians, a computer scientist, and an MD working on this. Um, and they wanted to, to look at um, what is the actual um, optimum scaling coefficient. So they said, hey, what if we cubed it? We think that might be better. Turns out it is, but is it the optimal? Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here is see, um, you know, is, is cubed optimal? Can we find an optimal scaling coefficient? And optimal defined two ways. Um, one is that it best predicts body fat percentage. So it, we minimize the, the misclassification. And then a secondary goal is we'd like for it to be stable across ages. So we can use the same cutoff for a five-year-old as an eight-year-old as a 13-year-old. And so our data um, all came from the NHANES data. Maybe uh, so a lot of you are probably familiar with it. This is a huge survey. New data comes out every couple of years by the CDC. There's tons of information um, in there, you know, in the survey. So, you know, obviously only looking at a small subset of it. Um, but there, there are some, it's not a nice, simple, random sample. And so this is really when they came to me. We've got a weighted sample. So certain subpopulations are um, upweighted and oversampled. Um, there are, there is still, are, there are still values missing in the data. But a lot of the clinical data is imputed. So the CDC provides five imputed data sets. Um, and so you've got, you know, if you want to do this right, you need to work with those multiple imputations. And then the thing that was the most challenging for me was um, we have this complex, you know, sampling design. Of course, they didn't just randomly pick 10,000 people from across the U.S. to sample. They have primary sampling units, um, which means we need to consider that in our analysis. Um, and so the, they were coding all of this in Python. And they originally came to me and said, can you give me, you know, kind of tell us what's going on. How, how can we calculate this? And so I kind of gave them some tutorials in R um, and said, you know, here's how we can account for these different things in R. And if you want to do it in Python, you know, you can figure it out. And, <laughs> and so I am pleased to say that, you know, after a little bit of trying, they came back and, and we did, in fact, do the analysis in R. Um, and so I think, oh, and we had um, about 12,000 adolescents over eight survey years here in this data. And so, you know, this is just an example snippet of code, but with the survey package in R, you know, it's, it's very simple. You've got to just maybe pay a little bit of attention to what your, your parameters are for your functions, but um, it's pretty, pretty easy to do. Someone else has, has put a lot of work into this package, and so, um, you know, they were happy at this point to, to take a punt, I guess. And so what were the results? On the left, we have a scale that, that the horizontal axis is the, the index of the exponent. So going from one, which would be a linear relationship, all the way up to height to the fourth power. Um, and the band shows the, the vertical axis is the misdiagnosis rate. Um, and the band shows areas that are not significantly different from the best. And so we see the absolute optimal um, scaling power is 2.9, um, and, and 3 was, was no different than 2.9 from a statistical perspective. And we're interested in the blue line um, gives us if we use the same cutoff for all ages. The green line down below says if we look at each two-year age group separately and design separate cutoffs. And of course, we can do better in that case. Um, but we're still doing better than BMI, even with the blue line. And then on the right, um, what we actually have is now on the 
and both of these are, are males only, so there are different cutoffs for males and females. On the right, we have on the vertical axis um, their age, and on the or sorry, on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis we have um, the the 50th percentile. So what we what we want is as we go across age, we would like for the 50th percentile to be relatively consistent. In fact, we like all percentiles to be relatively consistent, and we can do the 85th or the 95th or the fifth, and we get very similar graphs. And so if we look, sort of the third solid line from the bottom is TMI. Um, the second from the top, we have BMI, and we see that TMI does stay much more consistent across ages. So that's you know the secondary goal that we were looking for is also it's also beneficial to use TMI instead. And then the third project is looking at height versus all of these different body measurements. And so it could be your head height or your head circumference or your sitting height or your wingspan. And um, we had a collaborator that's a biologist that was interested in understanding how those different measurements scale to your height. So X in this case is you know, any number of different measurements. And, um, one of the, the folks working on this, and actually on all of these projects I got through uh, Diana Thomas, is a mathematician in our department that used to run an obesity research center. And the, the equation on the left should look like something that we've seen before. Um, if the errors are additive on the log scale, we can fit that as a regression model. And um, you know, it, hopefully things aren't too challenging. But after going back to the collaborator a few times, John Speakman's a biologist on this, we realized what he's actually interested in is understanding which of these two is the right form. So if, this, if these different body measurements scale to height differently for men and women, how is it differently for men and women? And so the graph on the right where we see just sort of a shift, but the slope remains pretty consistent across head height, but there's a shift up for men. And these, by the way, this, these are just made up numbers. Nobody's like 500 centimeters tall in our, in our data. I just wanted to show the different shapes that we were interested in. Um, and so the graph on the right, if that's the true relationship, is an indication that this change is an evolutionary change. And so women and men have evolved differently, but now we actually see you know, something pretty consistent within our different measurements. And so for me, from a statistical perspective, this was a really interesting thing to fit because on the right, you know, first I tried to do some convincing that we didn't really need to fit that model because I wasn't really sure what to do with it. And then I realized, well, we can just turn it into an additive error model and let's just try and see maybe if we have normally distributed errors. And we're still in the middle of this analysis, um, but I'll, I don't want to give you the punchline. So our data here came um, actually from basic trainees. Um, and so we have Army basic trainees at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. That's most of our support branches go through Fort Jackson. Um, all Air Force initial entry training occurs at Lackland Air Force Base. And so we have these Human Solutions 3D body scanners. We've got almost 10,000 soldiers at Fort Jackson and um, over 65,000 at Lackland. And one of the nice things here is, you know, there's nowhere near a third of the Army are fe uh, female soldiers. Mm -hmm. But all of 60% um, of female soldiers do their initial entry training at Fort Jackson. And so we've got about a third of our sample that's actually female. And so, you know, we just write up a little nice little likelihood function. We use the optim function to um, try to I actually maximize or minimize the negative log likelihood because that seemed to be a little easier. The only trick here is to tr you kind of have to have good starting values because um, this function is going to solve numerically. So if you, if you start off somewhere that's unreasonable, um, you're, you know, bad things are going to happen. So getting the variance, a good place to start for the variance takes a little work. But um, the, we're, this is still in progress, but so far um, you know, the models have actually fit very well to the point that I thought I had made a mistake in the first one because the error structure looked so normal that I actually had to call someone else into my office to check my work and make sure that it was, it was right. So um, what are the results? Stay tuned. All right. And those are just a couple of the papers that, that we've worked on. All right. Thank you.